All right, I'm going to start right now and welcome everybody to our first evening educational program on Facebook Live and Zoom. We uh, normally have these once a month. Uh, however, for the last year, because of the pandemic, we have been unable to provide these. So uh, tonight, through the help of Andrew Henley on Facebook and uh, Roseanne Felina on Zoom, we are going to offer you a program and hopefully get a lot of new viewers who've never been to any of our educational programs. Uh, at this time, I would like to say that if you would like to donate to the Historical Society, you can find uh, ways to do that online on our website. And I believe you can donate through our Facebook page as well. My name is Stephanie Felina. I'm the program, well, the educational program chair. And uh, Jean Spite, who is going to be our speaker tonight, has been doing these programs for us for Black History Month for many years. Uh, this year, because we've been trying to get this together with Facebook and Zoom, uh, we are combining two months, Black History Month, which was February, and Women's History Month, which is March. And the program that Jean has created for us tonight is going to hit on both of those topics at the same time. Jean Swite is a retired teacher from the Newcastle Area School District. Uh, she has been a board member at the Historical Society and she's been a volunteer there for many, many years. Uh, we have created many programs together. She uh, is um, retired, she says, but she told me she came out of retirement for this year to help us out on this new uh, project that we're doing. She's already done something for League of Women Voters and uh, the library, and this is the third presentation she's doing right now. So I'm going to turn this over to Jean. Now, comments will be uh, taken at the, uh, we'll record your comments and answer them at the end of the program. We are asking you all to be muted during the program. And then at the very end, uh, we will open it up for questions to Jean. So without any further ado, Mrs. Spike. Okay. Good evening. And thank you for choosing to spend some time with us today. As Stephanie told you, you're going to have a two for tonight. You're going to have a uh, dealing with Black history as well as March being Women's History Month. You can see from the title, Black Suffragists, The Untold Story. African-American women began to agitate for political rights in the 1830s, creating the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, and the New York Female Anti-Slavery Society. These interracial groups were radical expressions of women's political ideas, and they led directly to the voting activ activism before and after the Civil War. African-American women worked on two fronts simultaneously, reminding African-American men and white women that black women needed legal rights, especially the right to vote. So the origin of the women's suffragist movement is also tied to the abolitionist movement. Upper-class white women in particular talked about their own oppression in marriage and in private spheres, they use the metaphor of slavery. They had the opportunity to publicly challenge sexism and they learned how to politically engage as activists. Thus, the American suffragist suffrage movement began in the North as a middle-class white women's movement, with most of those members being from primarily white women being from Boston, New York, Maine, and other parts of the Northeast. Attempts were made by the National Women's Suffrage Association, the NWSA, to include working class women, as well as black suffragists. In 1866, the American Equal Rights Association was formed with the belief that everyone, regardless of race and or sex, should be given the right to vote. However, with the passing of the 14th and the 15th Amendment that granted, that passed by Congress, were eventually passed by Congress, 
and women were still not granted the right to vote. So the African-American and the white suffragist women had different issues. We came up with the question of white supremacy because the South was beginning to get involved into the suffragist movement. And this led to a disagreement between the African-American women and the National Women's Association, and they split. And it was at this time, June, we'll say 18 and 92, that we have the formation of Black women clubs. In Newcastle, we have a club known as the Paul Lunds Dunbar Club that still meets, well, not during pandemic, but it was formed in 1898. And another club, the Sunshine Kensington Club, was founded in 1909. These clubs not only talked about suffragists, but they also provided education and night classes so that the African-American women could better themselves. And they contributed to the betterment of the entire race. This having finished Black History Month and Women's History Month, oftentimes their stories are left untold. That's why you see the title of my presentation tonight, Black Suffragists, The Untold Story. In 1848, there was a big meeting in Seneca Falls, New York. That was the first convention gathering of more than 500 white women. And there was one black person present. That was Frederick Douglass. There were no black women in attendance. There was also a history written, the first history, back in 1841, I think my dates are correct, that talked about the suffragist movement. And there was not a picture or any information, excuse me, regarding any Black women. So once again, history just simply wrote out or did not write in the fact that Black women had also contributed to the suffragist suffrage movement. So what I've done is chosen some photos to show you some of the women that was heavily involved from the 1940s, 1920s, 1820s, until 1965 when the Civil Rights Act was filed. So let's look at some of those pictures and we'll, I'll talk about them as we go along. Here's a quotation I like. It, it, it makes you think about it and you have to stop and think and then you'll giggle. Sometimes I feel discriminated against, but it does not make me angry. It merely astonishes me. How can anyone deny themselves the pleasure of my country? Question mark is beyond me. That's a quotation by Zora Neale Hurston, who was a black anthropologist that wrote about the life in the South. And here's another one. Black women and their work during the suffrage movement and the broader fight for black voting rights is a part of history that has often gone unrecognized. And that is a quote by P.R. Lockhart, who is a writer for NBC. The next slide, I'm sure you'd recognize that picture. That's probably one of the few you'll recognize. And if you were talking to me and we were in, up, at the, up at the historical society, people would raise their hands and they would say, Sojourner Truth. Exactly right, Sojourner Truth. She was awfully thought to be the, an abolitionist, but I think that she was probably the grandmother of the whole, of the whole suffragist movement. Uh, back in uh, 1852, she made her famous Ain't I a Woman speech uh, it, at the Ohio Women's Right Convention in Akron. There is a historical marker there today uh, that talks about that. But she was born into slavery in New York and she finally got her freedom. She was not only an abolition, an abolitionist, but she talked about the rights of the lesser sex, so she called. So she was really one that was pushing forward uh, against racial equality. And oftentimes you hear quotes about from her anti-woman speech using uh, the so-called Negro dialect. She was never in the South. Her first language was Dutch and her second language was English. 
She was a big woman, like six feet tall, and they often said she would cast a spell over her audience. Uh, so when she was in Akron at the convention, making her speech, there was a heckler. And allegedly she ripped open her chest, her shirt, and showed her breast to prove that she was a woman. So and I a woman, Sojourner Truth. The next person is probably will not recognize her name is Frances Ellen, Ellen Watkins Harper. The dates are 1825 to 1911. And these pictures are not in really in a chronological order. But this is one of the first woman, second to Frederick Douglass. He was always accepted as an orator, as an abolitionist, as a suffragette. So this is the first woman uh, to have been a public speaker. And she was a prominent uh, writer, a poet, essayist, and she went to, on various tours talking about slavery, civil rights, and suffragists. She was born in Baltimore in 1825 to free Black parents. She received a rigorous education at, at a school founded by her uncle. Her novel, Iola Leroy, one of the first to be published by a black woman in the US, told the story of a mixed race woman raised as white and then sold into slavery. The book talked about race, gender, and class. And she was very much in demand as a speaker. And she, was pushing for equal rights for all. The next picture is a woman that sometimes she'd pass the white and sometimes she wouldn't, depending on what she wanted to do. This is Mary Church Terrell. Maybe you've heard, heard of her. She was from Washington, D.C. She was the first woman that was elected to the school board in Washington, D.C. But she was also one of those big club organizers. And she was the first woman to graduate from college. I see Suzette Spite is there. She graduated from Oberlin in 1884. She had a master's degree and a, an undergraduate and a master's degree. Uh, her big claim to fame is that uh, she spoke three languages. She spoke German, English, and Italian. And in 1904, she attended the International Congress of Women in Berlin, and she delivered a speech uh, concerning the achievements of African Americans. And she was switched from German to Italian and to English in delivering that speech. When she was uh, 87 years old, she lived in Washington, D.C., and she would go into a restaurant and sit in the white area, they would serve her. And then she would get up and move over to an, another area and have some of her African-American friends meet her and they would press as to why they could not be served. So she was quite crafty in her efforts uh, to get things done. She also was big in the club movement. Uh, she brought together many of the clubs under the banner of the National Association of Colored Women. She was one of the, as I said, she was one of the first black women to earn a college degree. And in 1898, she addressed the National Women's, American Women's Suffrage Association. She summarized her last work, her life's work, seeking no favors because of our color, no patronage because of our need. We knock at the bar of justice, asking equal chance. And here's a quote that I like of hers. Keep on moving, keep on insisting, keep on fighting for injustice. Mary Church Terrell, 18 and 63, 1954. And this is my favorite. I don't know if you recognize this person. This is Ida Wells Bennett. You might know Ida Wells Bennett as being one of those, the forerunner 
of the anti-lynching laws, and I think they finally passed an anti-lynching law, lynching law in Congress in 2020. But she was from Memphis. And as a young girl, her parents died and she had to assume responsibility of her, the rest of her family. Uh, so she became a teacher. And uh, she would ride the railroad back and forth to her job. And one day she chose not to go into the smoking car, which is the car that was set aside for black people. And they tried to take her off the train. Well, they eventually did evict her from the train. Uh, but she sued and she was awarded $500, but she never really collected the money. However, in 1892, she was in Memphis and three of her friends that owned businesses and were doing quite well, they were lynched. So as a result, Ida Wells Bennett and lots of people from Memphis, they left. She went to Chicago and started a newspaper and she was one of the early publishers uh, back in the time. And in 1933, she founded the Alpha Suffrage Club, the first African-American suffrage organization. Not only did they focus on civics and advocating the right to vote, but they also advocated educating Black women. And here, I think, is a, one of the best, best quotes that I, that I came across. We must educate the white people out of their 250 years of slave history. Amen to that. That's Ida Bells Barnett. I think I called her Bennett Barnett. This picture is one of the famous fortune. I don't know if you've heard that name, F-O-R-T-E-N. There were several of them. Their father, their parents were sailmakers, very well-to-do people from the Philadelphia area. And these women were very active uh, in the abolitionist movement as well as the civil rights movement, movement. She became a teacher and she was a member of the Female Anti-Slavery Society. She worked raising money for them, doing speeches and advocating not only for abolition, but also for suffragists. Charlotte Fortune. This person you would never recognize because you don't see her name or pictures anywhere. But her name is Mary Ann Shad Carey, 1823 to 1893. She was in the midst of the suffragist movement. She, uh, her home was used as a refugee for fugitive slaves. She was also the first black woman in North America to publish a newspaper, the Provincial Freeman, which advocated abolition as well as suffrage. She was one of the first black female law graduates in the United States, having graduated from law school in 1883. And when the suffrage movement gained steam in 1870s after the 15th amendment granted men the right to vote, she became an outspoken activist for women's rights. Her legal background served her well. In 1874, she was one of several suffragists who testified before the House Judicial Committee about the importance of the right to vote. In her remarks, Carrie stressed the injustices of denying women who were both taxpayers and American citizens access to the battle box, to the ballot box. The crowning glory of American citizenship is that it may be shared equally by people of every nationality, complexion, and sex. So she testified before the House Judiciary Committee in 1874.
Mary. This is another fortune. Harriet Purvis fortune. The Purvis family was also a very influential family from Philadelphia. She was a founding member of the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. She lectured against segregation for black women and also for black women suffragists. She was born to a free black family. She was a leading member of the Female Vigilante Society, which provided money, clothes, food, and transport for any runaway, runaway slaves. She had a sister named Margarita, and they were all involved in the suffragettes and the abolitionist movement. So she's part of that fortune family from Philadelphia. And for those of you that are Baptists, you might have heard this name, especially African American Baptists. This is Nanny Helen Burroughs. Her name is 18, her dates are 1879 to 1961. She made more than 200 speeches across the country, advocating education, feminists, and suffragists. She stressed the importance of women's self-reliance and economic freedom. She was a member of the National Association of Colored Women, the National Association of Wage Earners, and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. One of her lasting achievements was to launch and run the national training system for women and girls in Washington, DC. This I think came under the auspices of the National Baptist Convention. She was also spoke out against lynching and she traveled across the country speaking out against lynching. In the years 1916 to 1920, that was before the 19th Amendment, lynchings and white mob violence was quite prevalent against black people because of that activists like burroughs terrell and wells saw the right to vote as a tool to create laws and for protection for the african americans throughout the country this is one of my favorites he's from pittsburgh her name is Daisy Elizabeth Adams Lampkins, Lampkins. And she has a famous quote that my friend Stephanie Verlina loves, which is, nothing is done unless women do this, unless women do it. As I said, she was born in Pittsburgh and she was very, her life was dedicated to the rights of women in the United States. She was born in Reading, Pennsylvania, but she grew up in Pittsburgh. And while she was in Pittsburgh, her leadership skills were recognized. In 1915, she was appointed president of the new Negro Women's Equal Financial Federation that became the Lucy Stone Civic League. She was also heavily involved with the NAACP. She worked tirelessly for the NAACP. And she encouraged Thurgood Marshall to go in and become a lawyer. And he, of course, eventually bought the Brown versus uh, the board, Topeka Board of Education. She was really involved in women's rights. In 1920, uh, she became, uh, got involved in politics. And she was a alternate delegate to the National Republican Convention but she was also part of, she switched her political affiliations and she became a part of Roosevelt's black cabinet. She was the first African-American to be honored with a historical marker, which is in front of her house on Webster Avenue in the Hill District. She was also president of the Lucy Stone Women's Suffrage League. And as I said, later in life, she served as field representative for the NAACP. 
She's from Pittsburgh. You're going to see some pictures now. As I told you, uh, the first, I think I told you, the first volume of uh, American Suffrage that was published in 1881 did not have any pictures or any names of any African Americans. No photographs or nothing. Okay. Look at this picture very closely. I don't know if you can see the woman standing to the right. Look at her waist. Look at her waistline. The women's suffrage movement began with women such as Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and continued to women's like, women like Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Angela Davis, along with many others. All these women played very important roles to end African-American women disenfranchisement. That strength has been passed down from generation to generation. It is still carried in African-American families today. Here's another picture. The struggle to win the vote was slow and frustrating. A women's suffrage amendment to the federal constitution presented to each session of Congress starting with 1878. They repeatedly failed to pass. However, on August 18th, 1920, Tennessee, the 35th state, passed the 19th Amendment. Even though the amendment was passed, promising the right to vote, would the right to vote would not be abridged, denied to any person in the United States on account of sex. Yet many states, women of color were still barred from the from casting a ballot. For black women, the right to vote is only secured with the passage of the Voter Rights Act of 1965. Here's another picture. Even though we have celebrated a hundred years of the women's right to vote, we're almost going back now in the same direction during that particular time there was lots of ways that black folks were kept away from the polls the poll tax the grandfather clause violence lynching intimidation and we're doing different things today that is still keeping people away from the polls But the goal is still the same. We still want all citizens to be able to vote. So hopefully the next volume of history of the suffragist movement will have, you'll see names like Stacey Adams, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and lots of other people that have given blood, sweat, and tears for the right to vote. Black women suffragists came from a variety of backgrounds. Some were affluent, well-educated, working class, and some, yes, were illiterate. That's how the South was able to maintain power. You keep people from being educated, you can control them. The right to vote, as I said, is still being challenged and there are still issues today. I think uh, you'll see how the power is changing vote. The right to vote gives you power. And you've noticed that in the recent election in Georgia. So as people go from day to day, you look at the history books and you can see who's missing. I could have had similar stories about the Asian Americans, the Native Americans, uh, other groups of Americans that were denied the right to vote, even though the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment allowed everybody to write the vote. It really did not come to filtration. And our history books exclude a lot of people from their contribution. All, everyone living in America, every race, a group of people living in America 
have shed blood, sweat, and tears to get us to this point. So even though their story is untold, let's keep in mind that history is not, I want to say fiction, but in many times it is. As they say, the people in power are the ones that write the history books, but that does not deny us the right to seek and go beyond and find out the true story of what America, make America great. You see in front of you, my bibliography, some of the research tools that I use to put this program together. I hope I've been able to share a little bit of something maybe you were not aware of before. And I thank you for listening and I hope some of you have some comments and you can see the technical support. Those are people that are around me now that are, make sure this comes off the way it's supposed to. I thank you for listening. And now we're going to open it up for any questions or comments. Gene, if I may, this is Ed Petrus. Hi, Ed. I, I will say that I'll probably not remember some of the names that you've mentioned, but I really enjoyed all the stories. And your research is very much appreciated. Thank you. I thank you, Ed. Anyone else? Don't be bashful. Stop the screen share so you can see the people. Um, Jean, it's Heather Armstrong. Hi, um, Heather. Good to see you. Were Thank the you. were the lynchings mainly um, the lynching of of blacks, or was it everybody they were were trying to stop the lynchings of? Well, it was mainly black folks, but there's a horrific story about Georgia where a a Jewish man was alleged lynched because they said he had raped a, uh, a young woman. Uh, and a lot of the lynchings, you know, were alleged to have, something alleged to have happened. But it was mainly, uh, it was mainly uh, black folks. And as I told a couple of weeks ago, Pennsylvania was not immune. Their last, there was a lynching in Pennsylvania in 1911 in Chester, Pennsylvania. A man is alleged to have assaulted a white woman and they burned him alive. There is a new museum open, uh, I think it's in Birmingham. I was with, I went there a couple of years ago with my sister and it has, it shows you columns hanging from the ceiling for each state with the names and the dates of the people that were lynched. That's a terrible blemish on the history of America. And it's still happening today, just in different forms. They're not using ropes so much, okay? They're using knees, they're using guns. So, you know, it's just a different name. Anyone else? Yes, um, Miss Jeannie. Yes. Um, I would just like to thank you, um, especially as a part of the women's suffrage um, because I teach social studies and we we're always talking about Elizabeth Staten and Susan B. Anthony being a part of the great suffrage and the women's movement for the 19th Amendment. And we failed to realize that there was Black women who were a part of that suffrage, such as, such as Sojourner Truth um, speaking in Akron and things of that nature. But we don't pull those things out. We just basically talk about those two women. So I greatly appreciate that. You know, I'm going to add that in my lesson plan. Good, good. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Anyone and, else? Yes, this is Maria, your Hi, sister. Hi, Maria. Hi, how are you? Um, I want to point out Tennessee, the ratification that Tennessee did that was done uh, in Tennessee based on a woman telling her son that he right. needed to, to vote in favor of that particular law. And women still carry power. So I wanna say that. Yes, I did, read that, I did read that story. He cast the one deciding vote. Yes. Right. Yes. He did. Anyone else? We have a comment. Oh, okay, the comment says, Montgomery, Alabama is the location of the National Museum of Peace and Justice 
the anti-lynching museum. Yes, it, it, it hurts your heart. My sister Maria and I went there, what, two years ago? Two or three years ago. And it hurts your heart to see that and read that. It's, it's, it's frightening, like foreboding. You walk in to see these columns hanging. And they also have ashes. They have court jars with ashes from the, with soil from the uh, beneath the ground where the people were lynched. Yes, we have them all around. It's a, see America, go to, go to the South and some of the other places and follow the historical trail and see some of the things of the US. Yeah. And, and Jean, they yes. also had columns for each state if they wanted to get it, remember? That's right. That's for right. each state to put in their, in, in their capital yard so that yes. you can know what happened in your particular state. Yes, yes. Yeah. Anyone else? I have a comment. A comment, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, you were talking about lynchings a couple minutes ago. On March 14th, which is just a few days from now, in 1891, uh, there was a huge lynching in New Orleans. Can they hear you? Yes. Yes, they uh -huh. can hear me. Of Italian Americans, I believe 11. It's one of the largest group lynchings there was in the United States. So in answer to that question uh, that Heather asked, Heather asked about were other nationalities or races. Yeah. That's wonderful. So when we get together and share, we all can learn something from each other. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Jean. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, your presentation. And I'm proud of you because you did do your history. You, you, you studied. Thank you, ma'am. And you didn't just guess. Thank you. And, and that's what we need. We need answers. Yes, yes, yes. Ms. Patel is so glad to see you. Thank this you. Stephanie speaking. Thank you, bless you. It's wonderful to see you. Yes, Sophie's good waving to waving at you too. Bye, Susan. Okay. There was <laughs> good a comment. To hear there was a comment as to why women why you think the government didn't want people to women to vote someone someone else answered that question i have an idea but i'm sure somebody else can shed some light on that why do you think was it so important not to allow the women to write to vote don't be bashful i see it as a step to freedom and a step to overpowering and i i think that the way to stay on top is to squash other people down and by preventing people who have preventing people to who didn't have a voice to have one that allowed them to stay on top now don't forget uh uh in the early part when the 13th amendment of free the african-american in some cities in the south or states the black population outnumbered the white population. So it's a matter of power. You have all of these free people, all these people free, and they go to the polls and they vote. During the reconstruction, you had black people elected like to Congress, you had black people in the Senate, you had a black lieutenant governor in Louisiana, and they got there by virtue of black people voting. The same thing with the two Georgia senators. Black people and white people came together as a coalition and votes mean power. Next person. I think women have a lot of power because women are not afraid to stand up for what they feel like is right, whether they be cut down or not. But we gonna stand and we got a lot of power. And I just think we, we carry a lot of clout. Anyone else? Well, I think our time is about up. I want to thank I want to thank all of you. Yes, Andrew. Is it true that um, so during the women's suffrage marches in Washington D.C. that the African American women were put in the back of the of the per, of the march? Is that true? That is true because of the Jim Crow laws in Washington D.C. at that time. You know, we're talking about 
1913. The, the Jim Crow laws were still around. And uh, the black folks were allowed, were alleged, they were told to march in the back. And this is one of those side stories about Ida B. Wells. Uh, she asked permission to march with her Illinois group, Chicago group, and they said no. So what she did, she went down the street and waited until the Illinois group came, around, came down the street marching and she proceeded to present herself out there and march the rest of the way between two white, two white suffragists. Yes, but it was all because of the Jim Crow laws. You know, black folks and white folks couldn't use the same for soldiers and couldn't do this and couldn't do that. But Ida had a way of getting over on people. That's why I loved her. You know, she didn't take no for an answer, put it that way. Yes. Anyone else? Thank all of you. I do appreciate your attention. I appreciate your listening and your participation. And I hope you've learned something from this. I just touched the surface. And as I said, there are other people uh, coming along. Uh, Stacy Adams, if you don't know about uh, Abrams. if you Stacy Abrams, if you don't know about Ella Baker, read about Ella Baker. She's one of those that taught people how to go south and register through the Highland School in Mount Eagle. Uh, Angela Davis, you know, she might be a blemish on some of your minds, but read the story of her life and how she became involved with the right and the right to vote. Okay. A lot of women sacrificed and worked hard for this, and their name should be among the history books, as my niece was saying. You know, you might have to work to get them there, but we should stop excluding people. History is not a fictional fairy tale. And we need to pay very close attention to how, what we're doing about other people that work to make this country what it is. Thank you. Good night. Stay safe. Wear that mask. Wash your hand. When the shot comes around, go get yours. Okay? Go get yours. Protect yourself along with the people that you hang out with eventually. God bless. Peace. Good night.